Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. It's a very exciting uh, thing. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about something that is somewhat uh, beyond virtual reality, and at the same time that is uh, using somewhat some principles that are implicit into virtual reality, and that has to do with my aim of building conscious machines uh, that someday may leave Earth on spacecraft and explore the universe. That's the long-term goal, but for now, it's really, really the beginning, and uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to stay aware, or maybe it's my own mouse that makes this uh, reverberation, no? There is a nasty, like, feedback. That's okay. So it's uh, something I have been working on for the past 10 years uh, with mathematicians, uh, neuroscientists, and philosophers. And uh, the aim is to develop, based on the phenomenology of consciousness, I'm not starting from the brain. I'm a neuroscientist. I know the brain very well, to the extent we can. But I bracket it, uh, following the principle of Francisco Varela. Sometimes you need to concentrate on the phenomenology. He was my master. He died when I was doing my PhD with him. And I'm kind of trying to continue his work. And what I do is uh, uh, to develop a, a mathematical model of embodied consciousness at the crossroad of Varela and Carl Friston, who is a famous neuroscientist in uh, UCL. And in combination with virtual reality, and I'm going to give you some uh, uh, idea of what I mean by that, and what I want to insist on, one point of convergence, it's not just interesting for experimental research and simulation, it's also actually the same mathematics uh, that are involved in part. So there is here, that's what I claim in a way, and may interest you that the mathematics of our consciousness share aspects with actual technologies that we have uh, uh, in virtual reality. We live in a world which is scattered in academia. You know, psychology has many disciplines and that do not talk to each other. I'm trying to unify all of that through a great synthesis. And there is also an interesting uh, uh, um, differentiation in the way people approach artificial intelligence. Uh, today, what is very fashionable is the implicit big data, deep learning stuff that use all models with big machines and big data, but that you know, are interesting, and you know what Google and Facebook do with that. That's not what I do. What I do is more pursuing the old aim of strong artificial intelligence, which uh, uh, is really about uh, uh, starting from the fact of embodiment. Uh, it's, we are talking about systems, starting from us, that are basically uh, embedded autonomous systems. Uh, uh, you can take the example of robotics, but of course all biological systems are that way, and that have cognitive capacities, and that's from the analysis of these uh, systems that our theory derives, and that we are pursuing a development of strong artificial intelligence. So Varela used to say that we are situated agents. We see the world from a certain perspective. Often so we imagine the world from other perspectives. Sometimes I imagine myself in the moon or on the moon. We can do that as human. We are not stuck in the sensory motor contingency of the immediacy of presence like you have with an HMD, for instance. We go beyond. We project. And uh, it's very important in the animal world and in our world to anticipate what we do, and we often ask ourselves, what if I did that? Like, for instance, you know, I shouldn't go there, I will fall. Um, and in fact, part of what characterizes our consciousness, in particular in higher animals and like us, is this ability to project into counterfactual situations, being elsewhere, being present in the present, in the past, in the future. And one of the characteristics, to go fast on it, of this uh, field of consciousness as a, the experience we have of space with us at the center, or sometimes in third-person perspective, in imagination, is that this capacity of intentionality. We aim at things. We take perspective. Uh, it sounds visual, but in fact, I imagine things behind my back without seeing, because my memory is bringing into my field of consciousness a synthesis of sensory evidence, but also of uh, prior belief about what things are, who I am, and that affects me. And you can build mathematical model of that, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about it. And it's also about, you know, projecting in places or observing places to assess whether or not we like it, we want it, based on our layers of appraisal. Is it good? Is it morally acceptable? You know, and we have to deal with all these contradictions. In fact, if you think about it, the mathematics of these projections 
be it like in my local assessment of the world, or when I program my actions, imagining myself here, and then move like in active inference and having a different perspective. Well, in fact, they derive its projective geometry. It's a general geometry that unveils all geometry. And amusingly, it was initially developed before it was formalized in the context of the development of art and architecture uh, uh, in the Renaissance around the problem of linear perspective. Of course, it's a much richer and non-trivial geometry. And this is where we start for a model of consciousness. I'm not going to enter into detail. There are several phenomenological postulates I would have to expose. We have no time. But uh, bear with me. If uh, 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 what that yield is a very specific type of space that we call the projective space, that is in three dimensions, that any VR text knows that because they use somewhat the engineers this geometry to build those virtual worlds and project them on HMD. But it's a more general geometry than that. And uh, that's the geometry we can work with. And the interest of that is that this projective space are the the space on which the projective geometry acts, which is based on projective transformations. And the set of all projective transformations gives you the set of all possible perspective and point of view in perception or imagination. So somewhat your consciousness at each instance is a selection of a projective transformation over a space that you build based on sensory evidence and on memory. And that's just like some details of how the current model works. It's a machine that try to minimize a concept called free energy, which is to maximize its preference, and, uh, and do that using projection, taking perspective, imagining itself elsewhere or locally to find a better life. And why virtual reality? Beyond the fact that the mathematics are shared, it's also because it's a very interesting thing to build a real program of uh, psychology, both for normal and, and pathological behavior, because you use the machine to predict behavior be, based on mechanism you can control, but also to inform artificial intelligence based on human behavior and actually shape those machines based on your own behavior. You start from psychological, phenomenological model, you mathematize them, you implement computational model, and then you simulate those computational models, you make them act in virtual reality. Like anybody who develops video games is used to that. You know, there are a lot of non-playable characters. My model is a much more sophisticated model than obviously what you used to have in, uh, what you have in video games. It's not real time. It takes a lot of computational power. But in a way, it's the same principle. So you have the model that are simulated in virtual reality. You have people playing in virtual reality. I'm developing that. I'm not going to show you much about it, so it's a bit new. Uh, uh, and basically, you can compare them. You can look at uh, how they behave, you know, how they cross a space, how they face challenges, how they project themselves. You can, of course, record human behaviors, record the ratings of feelings, of experience, also physiology, and associate that to different points in space in your virtual object. And then in, your model can learn, and you can simulate, and you can converge towards something that is you know, predictive of human behavior based on similar mechanism. And the interest of that is that you can envision making artificial intelligence that are totally individualized based on your own prior belief that you sample. So my lab develops these things. We are developing a virtual lab that is a very sophisticated parametric uh, system that we can control the way we want, uh, and that we, will, we are in the process of coupling with this artificial intelligence. Uh, this is uh, something that my students have done. They are very, very good. Uh, they've done that in, uh, in a few weeks. You have very good young people that are very motivated and that can achieve great things. So that's just, uh, I don't have videos, but because I expected it could be a problem. This is just an example of you know, the model that is facing a bridge that it has to cross. The model believes here at first that it's good, they don't know danger, but in fact the reality is that there is a pit and it's dangerous. What you see on the left is very basic, right? It's what is perceived, then it's what it's imagined next. You know, it's here, it's imagining something else. I have to disclose that the emotion platform that I use, that I derive, and that shows on those faces, actually those faces, I made a bit, uh, there was a little bug, I did not have to, time to correct it, so those faces are not really the result of the, the current simulation you see, but it's just a little few lines of code I need to deal with. Because my model can predict emotions, it can predict gaze movement, it can predict most of our behavior. So the system is learning that, in fact, there is a pit, of course, so it's uh, updating its prior belief. 
and he's afraid, so he doesn't know what to do. And eventually, because it's like stuck in a situation, it starts imagining itself elsewhere. Because in its memory, it believes that there is a better place, a better world. And then what that does is that it helps the system to actually overcome its fear and cross the challenge, as we all do. And eventually, of course, it arrives there. It's not as good as it thought, but it's better. And the interesting thing is now, if you look at the computation of that, of course, if that is the across time, the perceptual experience, what it actually experiences, and that's imagination, the way it projects. It projects when it experiences a nasty world. This mod model will project and imagine a better world. As a result, it will get motivated and move toward the better world. And luckily, it's not awful, because sometimes we are mistaken. So all possible contingencies can be modeled into that. We can make very rich psychology with it, have optimal models that are resilient, but we can also can model pathologies psychotic behavior, autism, neuroticism. A lot of things can be studied with that. And I'm going to finish soon, but I want to add, add to that that beyond this general algorithm and its resilience behavior, we also can predict and explain, based on this framework, uh, most, a lot of standard psychological phenomena, from perceptual phenomena like the Necker cube. You know these things that switch in front of your eyes when you see these planar figures, you can't help. I cannot enter in the detail here, but it can be explained. The work of Olaf Blanke and Serrano and, uh, in, in their lab about, and others about this bodily illusion when you can see yourself from the back, this is entirely explained by a projective geometry combined with minimization of free energy. So you can now not only conceive of kind of uh, empirical approach and qualitatively theoretical approach of what is going on in this multisensory integration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I believe I know the math, and I'm going to make machine with them. And you can also explain a lot of things that are weirder, psychedelic experience and hallucinations. But you can, once you have a model of the mind, after bracketing for a while the brain, if the model is right, you know what to look for in the brain, and you derive hypotheses that are very specific. And as a result, you can do research in a way that is less empirical. Like, you know, if you take a brain, it's a complex machine, and then you can imagine 200,000 years of research not yielding anything really substantial. You also have to go back to theory and the first principle, and this is what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to build a robot. All right, that's it for today. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs>